but this is our 11th BAS workshop that we've done. So that means we've been around for 11 years as Best Center. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, just a quick recap on what funds the Best Center. It's the ATE program, Advanced Technological Education of National Science Foundation. Um, it's a very specialized program focused on community and technical colleges. So it's, it's our program, really. And uh, there's plenty of funding and you all should get a project grant going uh, if you're trying to do serious developmental work on your program. It's a great source of funds. Uh, it's really research and development funds for your program. Um, so there's some huge upsides, huge benefits. It's not like a DOL grant where you're trying to place a bunch of people right away uh, like you did with, uh, uh, well, some of those DOL programs. So it's a great way to get equipment. It's a, it's a good way to do innovative things. We have three, three people with us today who have ATE grants, Jenny Brinker, Ted Walensky, uh, and one more, Wake, or no, uh, yeah, Wake Tech, Connie. Um, and each one is doing something a little different. Ted is, Ted's project is focusing on outreach to disadvantaged communities. Jenny is focused on outreach to high schools. Um, so we'll hear from them a little bit later and find out more about that. Yours is just wrapping up. We, we got a year extension. So in the past year, BEST transitioned from being a national center to a national resource center. What that means is that our funding was cut about two thirds. However, Larry and I are working very hard to raise additional funds. We want to do all of our professional development that we've done historically, including these summer workshops. We appreciate people who were, who were able to leverage college funds to come, because that helps us, it keeps more money in our kitty for you, for you all. And we're actively working on trying to restore the National Institute in Berkeley in January. Um, we're working with the uh, Department of Energy to um, work with the National Lab and, and do more BAS work at the National Lab, using, you know, leveraging some DOE funding. So we're, we're still working on that. We'll keep you informed. So our goal is really uh, supporting the transition to high performance, energy efficient buildings. There's a lot going on now. Um, after swimming upstream for four years, uh, we've seen some fantastic new initiatives. The, um, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, has a lot of um, incentives in there for energy efficiency, for heat pumps, especially in the residential sector. And we're also tracking some other developments that I'll talk to in a minute, about in a minute. We still have our same three fundamental goals, work with colleges across the country to build, help you build your programs, work with industry, and then strengthen the STEM pipeline, very simple. Easy, right? <laughs> Especially the last one, STEM. Right. So Jenny is going to enlighten us on how to do that. Sure. Yeah. Who we are, we have now moved. We moved out of Laney College. We're now located at Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, in the California Institute for Energy and Environment. That was a huge transition. Uh, our mission remains the same. 
it's a very efficient, generally efficient place to, to work and operate. We left all the college bureaucracy behind, in a way. We now have research, research administrators helping support us. What well, we don't I have is, is good admin help for Larry. Well, I, I'd say that we traded in college bureaucracy for university bureaucracy. <laughs> I'll yeah. Come work for you, Larry. Come work for you. I'll be your editor. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's a whole different mindset, but but our our heart is still in the same place it always was, uh, with our community college and technical college faculty and students. Um, so you can see that you've all many of you have seen this diagram: the vertical axis, intensive progress; the horizontal, expanding the use of existing technologies. Most of the technologies we're talking about have been out there for quite a while, actually. Heat pumps are new, but it's fundamentally, it's based on the same fundamentals. What we need to do is more, better use of what we already have, especially BAS systems, and especially in the, in the commercial sector. And that's why this workshop is so important, and your work along these lines is so important. Uh, we do have this kind of focus on climate change and sustainability. It's in our name. Larry put it there, wisely or unwisely, best, building efficiency, etc. cetera. Um, so, what we're seeing is some interesting things going on uh, nationally. One of the things we're seeing is, is a new concept called high performance standards. And we're seeing that in city of New York, city of Boston, state of Washington, um, blue states fundamentally. And we're also seeing a lot more activity at the municipal level, reach codes, uh, decarbonization and and in a way there's been this kind of shift in the direction of decarbonization so electrification and building owners can now track uh, their sources of, of electricity so even though they're moving more heavily into electrification um, they can also see wh what's producing that electricity is it a coal-fired power plant uh, is it renewable, etc. So these new standards that New York and Boston have implemented um, are requiring building owners to make some, some fairly significant investments. But it's all sequenced out over a fairly long time frame. And the cities are very cognizant of building owners' needs. They're their business model, etc. So, so it's it's a very interesting evolution. Um, if you get a chance at our our last National Institute, we had three presentations, kind of looking at these new standards that are coming out, and I highly recommend them. Very very informative about what what's going on in that. And I don't know what El Illinois is really doing. Is El what? No. Is Illinois doing anything? Well, well we, just, we just hosted at the Palmer House the Energy Codes Conference for uh, National. Uh -huh. So we were there talking about, the, well, I was there talking about workforce for it. But, uh, you know, it, there's a big push. Uh, and obviously the politics have changed in the city of Chicago. We're more worried about, you know, not 54 deaths from shootings over Memorial Day weekend kind of stuff, you know. So we, they, we have other civil issues to manage first. but. There is a push for energy codes, and there was a lot of folks there that are very interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it just it, it it's determined building by building. Yeah. And, and some of the push, like you know, down around my area, uh, the the governor's kind of pushing like manufacturing. So yeah, so. it's a lot of manufacturing, and then uh, out of U of I, 
there's a lot of energy code work yeah. coming, and there's a couple of folks, and there's some really cool resources if anybody wants to see it. Yeah. <laughs> Integrate that into your program. Um, yeah, they, yeah, they're really pushing hard on the energy codes, and that's mainly where a lot of the code work that is getting articulated into the school systems is coming from. Yeah, good. So, so there are these uh, areas where things are happening, and um, so the need for the center, community, community and technical colleges are really the linchpins in this whole picture. We're the ones training the future technicians who are able to manage these new technologies and the applications of the technologies. Um, no one else can do it, really. So our job is fundamental, our work is, is crucial, and um, my hat is always off to educators doing so much with so little. And frankly, as we were discussing on the way over here, as we lose another full-time instructor, this time from Georgia Piedmont, um, out of the BAS sector, um, you know, the lure of the private sector is very powerful. And so each one of you in the room today, if you left your college, who knows what would happen? You know, is it really sustainable without your leadership there? Um, I just praise you for, for the heart that you have for education and for your students. Because without you, there, there may not even be a program at your college. Um, so I'm going to skip through there. Um, just some of the benefits for pe new people that are here. We have a lot of resources on our website, the be bestctr.org. Including links to all the past workshops and um, institutes where the videos that you mentioned a little bit earlier are located. So there's a lot of good information. I use reference in the classes I provide or I show some of the videos, so it's, it's a good resource. Yeah, the best way to get to, to the Best Center's YouTube channel is through the website. I don't know what happens when you try to just go to YouTube. It's kind of hard to find. Yeah. But there are a lot of good presentations. We are still working on how to make them easier to find, but um, that's a work in progress. We have research reports that are as relevant today as they were 10 years ago when they were written. Um, virtual lab tours. There's a great tour of Bob's lab in du College of DuPage. It's one of the best labs in the country. Uh, there's a good lab tour of Georgia Piedmont's lab. Um, what other labs do we have, Ted or Larry? I haven't looked at all of the virtual ones. Are any other virtual ones besides those two? Well, we've, we've got Laney College. Laney, we have yeah. Sacramento City. Pretty yeah, Sac City. So, there, so one of our goals there is to try to incentivize people to. We know that building your lab is a challenge, frankly, and you can always learn new ideas from seeing, well, nobody can replicate what Bob has done, obviously, but uh, each, each lab is unique. Um, and of course, PD. Um, some of the areas we're, we're looking at and following, obviously, BAS, uh, high performance operations, energy management, energy efficiency, lighting efficiency, microgrid technology. Um, demand management is one of the new, new things. Um, load shedding, load shifting, it's especially important in California where we have a fairly significant renewable energy uh, source. Um, 
and there's a lot of attention with the California <coughs> Energy Commission um, and Department of Energy to figure out how to move load around and that involves the operators uh, the engineers dream of automated everything and of course we know you know if something goes wrong blame the engineer right sorry Jim sorry Ted I'm good with that <laughs> um, but the technician has to has to really be right in the middle of all of that um, and of course as we talked about building decarbonization um, so it's really becoming more and more knowledge work what building technicians do um, the, the the capability of BIS systems uh, is really part of what we're doing in the workshop today uh, and a lot of it is untapped it's um, just to give you an example there's a building in Berkeley this is a lead platinum building the uh, facility manager did not understand BAS did not want anything to do with BAS he brought in an electrician and put in switches on the chiller and the boiler and he could physically turn on and turn off he was fired eventually and a new facility director came in and they did a new iteration they reinstalled the BAS system but this this building has um, in-floor heating and cooling so it has a lot of thermal momentum as they say uh, but this system was programmed to cycle on and off every five minutes and so you can imagine where that went eventually some smarter people went into the building and said no the, the BAS system should only activate heating or cooling once every 24 hours and the, the building has enough thermal mass um, so you know of course both of these <coughs> strategies the switch method and then the rapid cycling were hugely inefficient um, but but I mentioned this just to say that there's so much work to be done around BAS and just working with the system optimizing and so forth don't they call it a proprietary control strategy proprietary there's increasing interest in ASHRAE guideline 36 and I'll, I'll just mention that the controls companies are all developing libraries for ASHRAE guideline 36 um, if you have a chance go back and look at Steve Taylor's presentation from several years ago on ASHRAE guideline 36 there's just a lot of interest in it and, and it's very complicated the sequences of operations are very complicated but the controls companies say that they are busily writing the libraries of course the controls uh, contractors don't want to use somebody else's proprietary library they have their own way of doing things and so you know we have a little bit of a disconnect there but there is potential but like the rest of the construction industry there's a lot of disarticulation and then you know there's this whole AI thing happening people are talking about self troubleshooting controls and self troubleshooting sensors that will repair themselves as well you know Department of Energy want is thinking about this sort of thing chat GPT yep 
So let me update you on high performance building operation certification. Uh, quickly, this certification is, is what BEST has championed for a number of years. It creates a national standard for knowledge and skills to operate high performance buildings. It creates a national certification. We hope some of you will align your programs to it. The certifi certification test bank has been developed and the certification is now in the pilot phase. And you can go to www.hpbop.org and find out all about it. Um, yeah, we hope that many of you will apply and take the exam. Yeah, because it's okay. piloted it right now, so it's free. Yes. And Rob, I think you signed up, right? Have you scheduled your test yet? I have not. Okay. Well, not everybody in the room is eligible, and I'll show you the eligibility in a minute. You're, and you're not eligible, Bob, because you helped write the questions. I, I was going to ask if uh, maybe that's something we should do with all our students to see. We could, if you wanted to push for a, a, a test sample size and start moving students through it, absolutely. Reach out to yeah, well, well, let me. Uh, yeah, um, we need eligible volunteers to register and take the exam. What we we have a test bank of 214 questions. We want to refine that down to about 150 questions. That will give us 50 core questions plus two f blocks of 50 floating questions. And those floating questions allow us to, and, the, and the, the exam itself will be 100 questions. But if, if I fail the test and I want to retake it, I don't want to, they don't want to give me the same 100 questions that I had before. So they're going to give me the core 50, and then they're going to pull the other 50 from the floaters. So that's the idea, but we have to get through the pilot phase to throw out all the questions that are too hard and throw out the easy questions and kind of hit, hit that middle, middle ground. So I'll show you, show you the eligibility. We need your help. If you're eligible, please go into hpbop.org register, fill out the application, and schedule your test. And you get a certification that's nationally recognized along the way. Um, and we're also, by the way, we're, we're looking for inroads to organizations, large corporations, that may be interested in possibly wanting, looking at new future employees or existing employees and favoring those that have this certification. So any, any connections you have in that realm would be helpful for us to, to connect up with. Because we, we, want, we want to move the bar on the way buildings function. And the only way to get that done, or one of the ways to get that done is with the certification, help promote that they have somebody within an organization that has these skills to bring the whole building together, make it more efficient, more healthy for the documents. Yeah, so for example, many of your state have something kind of analogous to a Department of General Services that oversees operations for state-owned buildings, right? If you have students already, right, in your program that work for such entities, right, they would be kind of ideal people to begin reaching out to and then they in turn can reach out to their facility managers and directors. If you want to just, just pass the information on to us yeah. and we'll reach out to them. So also program gra graduates. If you have program graduates who have gone into industry for a couple of years, some of them are already working in industry when they're in your program, they probably will qualify as well. So let me show you the the, um, you, can you read that? No. 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 Okay. You want to 
describe that, Ted? Yeah, so <laughs> education and training, we have one for people with an associate's degree um, in that, you know, various technologies, and then you have to have two years of experience on top of an associate's degree. We have four-year BS um, in, in a closely related STEM field, so you have two years for that. So you, you start to notice we're, we're really trying to push the technician end of this, because this certification is built on elevating the, the way a technician is promoted within. Um, complete complete a state register apprenticeship, plus three years, military training, plus three years, specialty relevant post-second um, secondary certificate, plus four years, four-year degree, non-STEM related, five and five years, two-year degree, field not related, six years, high school diploma, um, you know, K-12 or adult education, plus eight years. So it, it, we're trying not to restrict any of our good technicians in this process. Any other thoughts on that? So this, uh, this is called the scheme, and the scheme was developed by a scheme committee. <coughs> Bob and Ted were both on that scheme committee. Uh, we're getting good uptake in the Chicago area. Uh, the uh, stationary engineers are, are uh, doing pretty well with, the, with it. Uh, one of the guys who's, uh, they're republishing the Chiefs magazine. Uh -huh. I was going to say, maybe I'll, I'll write an article. They were asking for some articles. Right? I'll write an article on this to see if <coughs> yeah. I go on. That'd be great. So people like, in Ted's program, which is a, 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 a technical diploma of, of one year, his people need four years. Of four years. Yeah. And of course, the AS degree, only two years. Oh, but it's, it combines education and experience. And, you know, it's pretty interesting that our degrees in this scheme are weighted as heavily as four-year degrees in related fields. And you notice there's nothing about master's degrees or PhDs in there. Yes. Yes, Jenny. Can you speak to the uh, application process? What does that look like? If I reach out to a student, where do I tell them to go and maybe work in the field? How do they prove their... So it's a very simple process. Um, it's all on hpbop.org. Um, you create a login. You fill out the application. Uh, there is a participant guide. So it, there's a lot of information about certi certification in the guide. Uh, and you submit your application. Uh, how long did it take you to fill that application out, Rob? About 15 minutes. Uh, but I took a break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, be, be, this certification meets uh, international standards, ISO 17024. So that means, you know, one of the things we have to do in that application document, we have to have verification information. Uh, it's really required. We're not going to call and verify that Rob really worked for the Air Force. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> but we have the information if we had to audit Rob's application. So, but it's it's very straightforward. Can you test from your computer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all done by the computer. It's proctored, right? You have to it's proctored virtually. Oh, I get it. Yeah. The exam itself, uh, the company is in India, I think. Larry found a. Well, they're in the They have multiple sites, but they are a U.S. based. Okay, but you can schedule the exam 24/7 to your own convenience. Do you have a procedural uh, written up on what you got to do in the whole process so that? It's all. Will you just email it up? Yeah. Well, it's all there. Uh, once, once we screen your application, you get a link to the virtual testing system. And then they give you all the procedures in that process. Yeah. So. Is it, is it the one where you have to show your whole room? And yep. Each other and no posters or yep. Like yep. Right. They do do a, but it's not a continuous uh, 
360 scan. It's just a one-time 360 scan. They, they did not like my room. <laughs> that's that's what I was gonna say. So you gotta be in an empty room. Yeah. Like, well, what did they? Yeah, you had like five monitors, and so. Uh, it's not an open book. No, no. Well, you know, opening a book is really not going to help you anyway. How are you? Yeah. It's a timed test. Um, so. There, it, there is no book for this. Test. There's there is yeah. no book on this. There is the yeah. DACUM. The DACUM's available. Right. The, yeah, the DACUM is there. Yes. If you fail, what is next? If you fail, you can retake. Retake. Oh. Okay. Yeah. After the pilot ends. And we're getting, you know, we're getting a fairly broad range of scores. Um, so, yeah, but it's it's a very straightforward process. Have you actually gone in to schedule your your test yet? I have yet? not gone in to schedule now. I, I got the email prompt that said that my uh, uh, application was accepted, yeah. but I, I've been too busy to go in and really take a look at it. I did go in to my profile, and that's where I was able to see the datum and everything, but I didn't see a prompt to schedule a test, but I was not carefully going through it. Yeah. Uh, but I did not receive any email prompts or anything to schedule a test. Right. You, you will start... You know, we have, how many people have, how, how many people, yeah, the number of people that have actually taken the test is only about 10 at this point. But how many people have have registered for the test and been accepted? About 40, more than 40, right? 45. So you will start to get emails from us, Rob, encouraging you to, to actually schedule the test. And it's a little bit daunting because it's all online and you have to go through some rigmarole to, to get connected and everything. Right, Ted? Yeah. It, it took a little bit. But we had to work out some bugs on the other side. Yeah. And it was a complicated thing. We've got three different websites all interacting with, e with each other. But we tried to make it as convenient as possible. You don't have to go to a test center or anything like that. It's from the comfort of your own home. And like for you, Cameron, we're developing a uh, curriculum guide. So we hope to have that out sometime soon. Mm -hmm. so, so a program like yours in facilities can probably play off of that to help educate some people on possibly them taking an exam through the certification. Yeah. So uh, one other big ask today, we, are, we want to interview some of you, the, about a 45 minute interview, particularly people who have programs that are related to energy, energy efficiency, have coursework or course content in those areas. So we've already identified Ted's program, Jim's program at, at Delaware Tech, Jenny's program, uh, Brad's program, Pierre's program, of course, at Riverside City College, and possibly Mount Sac, and possibly Tri-County. Um, anybody really teaching energy efficiency in your program that we've missed? want to be interviewed. Are, do, are, do you do anything with that, Bob, a little bit? In all the classes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Energy efficiency has got to be a part of a program's culture. Okay. okay. How else are we going to change climate? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll be, we'll pull you out of the lab sessions to do these interviews. Hopefully uh, that'll work. And uh, this will also give us a little bit more revenue to help fund the, the National Institute, and your particular, your transportation to California in January, which is always good. Yeah. Let's talk climate change for just a minute. Don't you love Great this graphic? <laughs> sure glad the hole isn't in our end. They're only floating on that uh, island of garbage in the ocean. 
Yeah. Uh, go to the next slide. So the, the, the trends on climate change haven't really changed a whole lot. Uh, global average temperatures continue to rise. The polar regions are really being impacted. Uh, glaciers are retreating all over the globe. Um, we appear to have destabilized the global climate. And we're seeing those effects everywhere. We're also seeing climate refugees. And those numbers will continue to grow. A lot of the, a lot of the uh, migrants at our own U.S. border are climate refugees from drought in Central America. The, the land can no longer support them. Um, this problem is not going to go away. Uh, after a brief respite, global CO2 emissions have begun rising again, um, and so forth. Uh, Can I ask a question about that? Yes. Do, um, are they, I mean, have you experienced anything, I don't know if this is off topic, but the, the way to monetize uh, carbon credits? I mean, it really, that's just still like this idea in the air that really isn't structured enough and I mean that plays into this I think huge um, especially when you talk about building efficiency yeah to let the irresponsible corporations get by by paying for carbon credits right right and I don't know too much about that whole scenario uh, I think a more effective way would be a carbon tax and we came very close in the U.S. to getting a carbon tax in the 1990s. And there was a huge full court press on the Senator David Boren from Oklahoma, actually, who was the chair of the Energy and Environment Committee of the U.S. Senate. Bam, that carbon tax concept was floated out there. He was hit from all sides of the fossil fuel industry he decided quickly to drop, and the, that legislation never saw the light of day. But that became the blueprint um, for pushing back on regulation of, of fossil fuels. Um, you mentioned like global CO2 emissions, um, like, you know, They've used CO2, you know, CO2 as a refrigerant in the past and then starting to kind of come back <coughs> and a lot of landmarks and sands and stuff like that. Does that affect the meaning of that or not? Well, in theory, that refrigerant is not supposed to leak out. But I think the... You lose power in those. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think in the, in the big scheme of things, transportation, heating and cooling, uh, f from an energy standpoint, energy production, those are the big areas producing uh, greenhouse gas equivalents or carbon dioxide equivalent. Not so much the, the refrigerant. What would you say, Ted? I, I guess my gut reaction is typically the CO2 is just being taken from the source where CO2 already is, such as the air. So. If it just leaks back into the air, what's the big deal? Right. That encourages climate change there. That's not good. That's well, it's a lot better than the alternatives. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. like the other it's refrigerants have like much more, like what, hundreds of times the CO2, their gold barring potential CO2. But I mean, you guys know more about the, like what holds the refrigerant. And you mentioned that these CO2 systems would power all of that CO2 goes back. Now in a standard refrigerant, like and refrigerant, we're working at, you know, 100, you know, 300 PSI, but when you're looking at CO2, you're looking at over a thousand PSI. Yeah. So, I mean, pressures, you're, you're dealing with much, much higher pressures. So dangerous. But, I, you know, the, I think the bigger issue, I think Jenny's is referencing, that 
some of the other refrigerants were were much more severe uh, climate global warming elements in the atmosphere. Methane is is hugely important and and methane leaks methane leaks from this from uh, drilling sites it leaks from pipelines um, so that's your whole uh, uh, natural gas sourcing I would say probably as a refrigerant it's it, it's it's probably negligible in the big scheme of things not not that it's not important but its its relative importance is fairly low. Well, for, from a refrigerant standpoint, it seems like it's kind of coming. We used to use flammable refrigerants in the past, and now you know we we went to non you know flammable refrigerants, and, and now we're coming back to it you know because they're more of a natural natural refrigerant. But I don't know. It, it just seems like it's more dangerous for us to wind up working with it though too. And Refrigerant companies are no different than the oil companies, how they manage their refrigerants. And, and, but I like the concept of CO2 refrigeration just because, you know, it's a way to package and store when you're scrubbing it off of the emissions. Yeah. You know, it's got potential. But you're using a refrigerant cascading yeah. into another refrigerant. Yeah. So that's well, the thing. well, as far as the uh, being dangerous, I um, mean, the one argument that they would say is, you know, we, we all drive cars here with as gasoline with high flammability and all that and we're fine with it and we all use the propane tanks which is dangerous too and I'm pretty sure none of us really properly store it is how you're supposed to store it, right? So mm. hasn't had have anything happened yet. Yeah. Right. And so that's the argument I was here, especially with the A two L. I guess the condition for an A2L refrigerant that's been coming out for it to actually combust is really hard to, you know, to do as far as, you know, you got to be in a tight room and it stays uh, as much refrigerant coming out. So it's not just that. When you take away the ignition source, it extinguishes itself too. Mm -hmm. That's one of the A2L properties. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of that. And as far as, I, I'm, you know, as far as science, I know, Sometimes they push propane and disappear and it comes back again. And they're trying to figure out experimentation too. I mean, nothing the first time works right. And everyone knows that. So mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out which one's really the best. I understand money is behind which one they're going to make more money to. So that's, yeah. that's usually the way I see it, right? Isn't Robert demonstrating this afternoon? We're going to burn some refrigerants? <laughs> well. A couple of good points there. I mean, money is really a driver. I don't know how many of you saw this article recently about leaded gasoline. Leaded gasoline, you know, cars had a knock. They, you know, they didn't run smoothly. There were two options. One was to put uh, alcohol into the gasoline mix. The other, somebody figured out, let's put lead. Well, lead, leaded gasoline was highly toxic. The companies knew that it was highly toxic. People were getting sick in the labs producing the stuff, in the factories producing it. Uh, why did they go with leaded gasoline? Because they could control the patent. They couldn't control the patent on alcohol infusion. That, that actually happened uh, a bunch of times throughout the years because I read, you know, there's the leaded gasoline, there's like a, was it radium, right? They use it as a glow in the dark back in the day. Uh -huh. uh, asbestos is one of all those are big things. Asbestos, oh, it's the best thing ever, right? I mean, but now we're like, oh, okay, well, it's really bad for you. Yeah. So, as far as re research and development, we, we are technically the test subject for those things. And if no one gets sick, oh, it must be fine. If we get sick, oh, something's going wrong, but it takes a long time. So uh, I think the other, uh, the other point you made, which is that we don't always have all the answers, we're in a period of experimentation. Mm -hmm. Nobody really has all the answers, but we do know we've got to act. And that's this last point here. 
the window is closing. And what we've seen since the IPPC started meeting was the crisis has just kept growing and everybody was meeting in some city and say, making commitments to do things, but never really doing things. And so the burden, the required vo volume and speed of, of reductions has just kept growing and the window in which to do it has kept narrowing. And that's where we are now. Next slide, Kim. And there's this kind of global push-pull uh, that is notable. Norway, for example, has demonstrated that you can move very quickly to electric vehicles. Now, they have a great supply of uh, renewable energy. Yeah, Jim. Electric's the way to go. I have my, I'm on the second generation electric. Yeah. Have you seen the, uh, there's a, yeah. there is a, an issue with the, the weight of batteries on the road. Have you heard that for the bigger trucks? No, no. I think, yeah. I think yeah. hydrogen might be the way to go with bigger sure. trucks. Sure, sure. Well, yeah. what I'm saying, there's, they're finding with bigger trucks. That it's not to say it's better. Yeah. They're using, they're using a tax so you mean yeah, the, uh, the urban assault the vehicles they got out there aren't bad enough? Yeah, you get too many. They're, they're big enough with the... Yeah, I think, you know, hydrogen fuel cells are going to be the way to go with big trucks. Um, right now in Germany, there's a coalition government with the, the free Democrats, the social Democrats, and the Greens. And, and the Greens are pushing for residential heat pump technology, policy mandates. The Free Democrats are, are saying no, and they control the economic ministry. Um, it's, it's actually fragmenting the governing coalition a bit. So we'll see how it plays out. There's, there's all of this tension between forces. The Russian invasion of Ukraine heightened the global energy supply concern. Um, the UK has made some pretty rapid gains. Um, the fossil fuel sector nationally and internationally remains a global political powerhouse here in the US and globally. You have a, a whole network of petrostates who really want us to continue to burn fossil fuels. Um, Fukushima really pushed Japan to go back to fossil fuels because Fukushima is still a major global problem. The uh, fuel rods at Fukushima, when, when Fukushima melted down, the rods twisted. So they can't be removed and, and neutralized. They have to continue to be cooled. And ultimately, radioactive water is going to be pushed into the Pacific Ocean. They don't have any more storage capacity for this. Um, and so they're burning a lot more coal now in Japan. Uh, in the US, we see this red and blue state conflict. Texas, for example, right now, has a huge wind, wind energy industry. But Lawmakers in Texas are trying to disincentivize renewable energy and incentivize fossil fuel energy. Um, we have a balkanized, regionalized electrical grid. And it operates like that. So it's another huge challenge that we have. And there is no silver bullet here, but a lot of silver buckshot. And um, the Inflation Reduction Act is, is huge in the, in the history of the US. I really have to give the current administration a lot of credit for that. Um, US cities and states are adopting building performance standards. Um, Canada has implemented a national carbon tax, but with r strong resistance from Alberta, where, where all the oil comes from. 
Um, I don't know. It, there's a lot of activity at the municipal level to decarbonize. Um, wind energy is out producing coal-fired plants in Wyoming, right, Rob? What's that? Have they figured out how to tax the wind in Wyoming? Not quite. Okay. We have plenty of. Them. Yeah. Just can't move it across the nation. Okay, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, some of our goals here, really renew and build our network. Uh, it's great to see everyone. I'm going to do some BAS exercises. We're also going to develop and share lesson plans. We're also going to talk about troubleshooting and how we teach troubleshooting. <coughs> share ideas about that in a few minutes. And we're going to learn about uh, some, some of our projects that are going. Um, the Lab in a Box, which is a fascinating project. We'll also be talk hearing from a, a guy in New York City who's using building data so that to teach technicians using their own data to interpret data and make corrections. And then we're also going to hear from Bob's group from TRAIN who want to do something similar. So we'll be hearing from them about that. Um, and of course, participate in lab activities. I think. Any questions? Hearing none. All right. Well, we're we're going to kind of mix up the schedules a little bit. Bob and I are supposed to talk now, but we're just going to take a ten-minute break and flip our break around and. You can get out of your seats and do what you got to do for a little bit, and then we'll come back in, and Bob and I will start back up.